Hi there, and welcome to the Sunshine Readers Book Club. I'm Mr. Jonathan at the Osceola Library System, and today we're going to be talking about Gamer Squad, Attack of the Not-So-Virtual Monsters by Kim Harrington. I loved this book. If you like gaming, or if you like Pokemon Go, or if you're starting a new school this year, I think that you'll like this book too. It's about Bex, a girl who's about to start middle school, and her best friend Charlie, a boy who has an older brother who bullies him. Bex and Charlie like to play a game called Monsters Unleashed on their phone, and it reminded me a lot of Pokemon Go, because in the book, you use your phone to find virtual monsters out there in the real world, and and then, instead of launching Pokeballs, you launch nets to capture the monsters and put them in your little vault on your phone. Well, Charlie and Bex are about to enter middle school and they've been friends for a very long time. But Bex also used to have another best friend named Willa, who is no longer very nice to her because she wants to hang out with the cool kids and Charlie and Bex are not cool. So Willa is very mean to her, which as you can imagine, it's probably very hard to have someone who's a really good friend who suddenly isn't very nice to you. But Charlie and Bex one day are visiting Charlie's grandfather and they go up in the attic and they find a mysterious machine and somehow this machine unleashes the monsters in Bex's vault on her phone so that there are 10 monsters out there in the town and they have to capture them by using their phone and launching nets. But the monsters are a lot harder to catch in real life than they are in the game. So I thought this book was very interesting because not only do they have to find the monsters, but also Charlie has to learn how to stand up for himself and Bex has to learn how to be a good friend and how to depend on other people in the town and maybe how to depend on Willa again, which would be hard to maybe reignite a friendship that had already kind of dwindled because that person wasn't very nice. It's hard to find forgiveness for people, isn't it? So there was a lot of themes to explore, and I'm going to explore them with my friends right now. Hi there, it's Mr. Jonathan again, and I'm here with my friends, Miss Michelle from the Poinciana Library, Miss Lisa from the West Osceola Library, Miss Susan from the Buena Ventura Library, and Miss Crystal from the St. Cloud Library. And we're going to talk about Gamer Squad! So, let's talk about some of the themes of the book. Now, Bex and Willa are best friends before the book starts, but then they start to not be friends because Willa is treating Bex different because she wants to hang out with the popular kids instead of Bex, and that really hurts her feelings. Have you guys ever had something like that happen where a good friend started treating you different or maybe uh, you got older and you lost your connection? Anybody want to talk about something like that? childhood oh, I have childhood friends that I grew up with and we were best friends all the way from kindergarten till about sixth grade and then their interests changed um, and then my interests changed and it, it it was different after that um, we still talk today we can pick up where we left off before but you can always tell there's a little a little rift there that that because their interest went into sports and mine was more into the marching band. So it kind of, we kind of split off there and I ended up with new friends and it was kind of a rift. I didn't like it, but. Yeah, that's hard. That's something probably all of us have gone through is you grow up with one group of friends and then you lose your connection as you get older and as you make different choices in your life. But the good thing is you make new friends and new people come into your life. Oh yeah. And just because somebody goes out of your life doesn't mean that anything is wrong. You can look back on those memories and still remember the good times, even if you're not still in contact with that person. Yeah. So uh, Bex wants to grow up to be a programmer because she says that gaming is her special talent. Uh, do any of you have a special talent that might surprise some people? Nobody? <laughs> I'll tell you one of mine. <laughs> Uh, I write, uh, so I write short stories for, uh, magazines or podcasts and things. That's my special talent that I don't necessarily, uh, talk about at work, but. I play musical instruments. Oh, what kind of musical play, instrument? I can play a saxophone and a clarinet. Oh, wow. Wow. 
Wow. Super cool. I love to paint, like, like paint, paint, not just crafty, but people will come into my office and see the picture of the flowers and they're like, oh, who did that? And I'm like, oh, that'd be me. Uh, but it's just not something that I do. Yeah, it's not something that I, it's just something went for me, myself. I love that. So, because only people who play Monsters Unleashed can see the monsters in the game, Bex and Charlie choose to try and catch the monsters themselves without telling their parents. What do you guys think? When you were a kid, if you were in danger, would you think it would be a good idea to tell grown-ups, or would you have kept it to yourself, too? Ooh, I Susan? kept it to myself. <laughs> Really? Yeah. Totally. yeah. <laughs> totally. I think I probably would have too, but I think that still would have been a bad idea. Like, I think it's probably always a better idea if you're in danger to tell a grown up. But I mean, what is a good idea and what you actually do sometimes are different things, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Well, your parents believe you too. Yeah, that was what they thought, too. Bex was worried they wouldn't believe her. So, yeah, yeah that makes sense. Monsters aren't real. <laughs> that's right. I think that's right. I think it depends on uh, would my parents have believed me if these these monsters came to life and were right there and because they couldn't see it. Yeah. So I would think that they would think I was crazy. Yeah. But if it was something that that they could see, Bullying, harassment, um, I would definitely, I mean, I, I couldn't handle it. I'd have to tell a parent if it was something that I knew they could help me with. Right. Uh, but in the, in the circumstance of the book, you couldn't see the monsters. Yeah. Well, so, speaking of bullying, Charlie yeah. deals with bullying from his older brother in the book, and he eventually has to stand up to his older brother. Have any of you ever had to stand up to a bully before? Lisa's nodding, yeah. Do you want to talk I think about all it? All of us have. I had um when I was young, I had a, a little boy at the bus stop who used to tease me all the time because of my hair color. And he used to call me carrot top. And I used to come back with the tops of carrots aren't red, they're green. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I used to get That's teased true. an awful lot when I was oh. little about my hair color. Yeah. What a silly thing to tease I, someone I got about. about my height. And I had, in seventh grade, this kid, uh, he's like, you have on high waters, which is pants that are too short. And uh, he was short. And I, it wasn't very nice to me, but I told him, I said, yeah, you're just jealous because you're not tall like me. You know? Um, so even though I had the bullying, I think I always had a compact. Yeah. yeah. Susan, so, you were raising your yeah, hand. I got, te I got teased a lot because I'm a farmer's daughter, <laughs> okay? Even teachers would awesome. say inappropriate, you know, have you heard the one, you know, seriously. But um, there was uh, some kids that rode the bus with me that just tormented the daylights out of me. And I told my oldest sister who got on the bus and pinned him up against the back of the bus. She grabbed him like wow. this and put him against the wall and proceeded to, um, yeah, be a bully. <laughs> but he left me alone after that. <laughs> That's hard yeah. to deal with. It's hard to figure out how to deal with uh, having a bully. I had lots of bullies growing up because I always kind of liked girl stuff. So I always liked reading or, like, when it was gym time, I didn't really want to play basketball uh, and it's hard to figure that out. And I, there's no necessarily right or wrong way. Sometimes you have to stand up for yourself. Sometimes uh, you have to tell a, a grown up, you have to tell a teacher or your parent, um, because you don't want to be in danger. Sometimes you just need a good friend to talk to. But the important thing to remember, I think is, it eventually does get better, you will grow oh, up yeah. and be in control of your own life. And if you're going through a hard time, you just have to get through it. Because one day you'll be a grown up and you'll get to choose the kind of life you want to live. Yep. So. And I think too that it kind of makes you the person who you are mm -hmm. as an adult. 
So my mother used to tell me, just let it, you know, just ignore it. Just let it slide off your back. And when I was little, it was really hard to do that. And I had to pretend that it didn't bother me when it really, really did bother me. But I tried to let it, like I, like I said before, use silly things like, you know, Carrot Top is green. And Michelle said, you come with, with an answer. Yeah. But it still bothers you, but you kind of let it slide off your back and let it know that they're doing it because usually they're insecure about something about them. They are trying to get the focus off of them and onto someone else. So you have to realize that. And then you will go, okay, whatever. And then as you grow older, that kind of makes you the person that you are. I think I'd be a different person if I wasn't bullied as a kid. And not that it's fun, but I think it helped to make me the person I am. Yeah, absolutely. When I I was a teacher, uh, when the kids came to me and they had been bullied, uh, I thought fifth grade was the fifth and sixth grade was the hardest for the kids. Um, they would come to me and tell me that they were being bullied. Um, but I, I, I listened. Um, but I, you also have to stand up for yourself. And I would tell them, you need when you tell this person to stop what they're doing, you have to tell them to stop. You know, hey, stop. I'm tired of it. I've had enough. If you don't stop, I'm going to let Miss LaPlante. And... If you go to the, if you don't stand up for yourself, they'll keep doing it. Like Lisa said, they're doing it because it upsets you and they want that. So standing up for yourself, you have to stand up for yourself, but I know it's scary. I know it's hard, um, but do go to an adult. Do have an adult help you with what can I say to this person? How can I make this person stop myself? Try to stop it yourself first. And if you can't, that adult will still be there to, to help you deal with it. But yeah, you, you have to try to stand up on your own and, and be strong. That's and I great. think that helps build your character. Yeah, it does. It's, it's the bravery thing where you do something in spite of the fear of it. And it yeah. does, it helps you grow into a, a, a better person yeah. and, and overcoming that. Like, Oh, what if I do say something to him? Are they going to do something back? Even if they do at least still build that up a little bit so that you're, kind of not being walked on and you're you're right. you're taking this step to become a better person so yeah i agree with you michelle great well this was great let's move on to an activity All right. yes. i love reading the same book as my friends because then we get together and we talk about our favorite parts how we felt about different characters and how we thought the book was going to end so i hope when you read this book you do it with a friend too and now we're going to go visit Miss Crystal. She's going to talk about her hobby of geocaching because Bex and Charlie have to go around town and find the different monsters with their phone, right? Which kind of reminded me of something Crystal does, which is she does something called geocaching where she uses her GPS to find treasures around town. So let's go check it out. Hi guys, I'm here to talk to you about geocaching. That's right. Are you looking for a fun way to exercise your mind as well as your body? Let's try geocaching. Yes, it's an outdoor activity that you use your smart device as well as um, satellites that are in space uh, to find a tech-aided treasure hunt. Uh, The name derives from a mashup of geography as well as cache. Um, And instead of the old time parchment maps or the folded maps to find a treasure, you're actually using your smartphone or GPS to search out in the wild blue yonder for different um, containers for you to find, search and discover. Um, They're usually hidden in an eco-friendly area. Um, It doesn't disturb anything and usually placed with permission by either the landowner Uh, property owner or even by uh, county and state properties with that. Uh, To get started, I would suggest visiting geocaching.com. There you can sort of explore their website, but if you've decided that you're really up for uh, taking the Mm -hmm. next step, you can um, log into it with your name, email, and create a username for yourself. Our username is the number four and then Hamrix. Um, That's what we use to also not only log into geocaching.com, but what we sign on the log books when we find the treasures out in in the hidden areas with that. Um, In addition to hunting for caches, geocaching.com is loaded with helpful uh, tips, information, 
ideas um, and just tons of stuff for you to learn about what geocaching is, how to be a good geocacher, um, even how to, even if you want to start hiding caches, which that's something that you, after you've uh, found uh, several caches before you do, but there's a lot of really good information on their website to help you learn a little bit more about geocaching as well, because I'm just going to barely touch on it. Um, you would be considered a newbie. Non-geocachers are considered um, muggles. That came from um, the Harry Potter book series where um, non-magical people were considered muggles, so non-cachers are considered muggles as well. Um, if you have a smartphone, um, either an iPhone or a Android, you can use um, a downloaded app on iPhones. It is Cashly. For the Androids, it is either geocaching.com or the CGO app that you can download and it will help you find caches um, around the area that you're in right now. Um, it depends on your mobile phone and, uh, and the GPS locations for what you're looking for. Um, I'm not going to go into detail today about GPSs, but um, they're very helpful too as well as for finding geocaches. When looking for caches, um, taking consideration that they come in um, a five-star rating, one being the easiest, five being the most difficult, and that includes a one through a five of either terrain or the type of um, like cache it is. Uh, when I say the terrain, if it's level ground, it's probably a one where a wheelchair can be on it. If it's a five, it could be out in the middle of a lake. It could be up a mountain, climbing a tree, something like that. That's that type of terrain. Uh, when you're talking the type of cache it is for from a one to a five, one could be a super sim simple where it just tells you here's the coordinates, you go to here, that's where you find it. To where it's a five where you might have to solve a puzzle, you might have to actually use um, maybe different steps to figure out how to find the GPS coordinates for it. Um, it may be um, some type of um, different activity that you use to get those. And again, geocaching.com will explain it, plus there's all kinds of different ways to create puzzles, hiding caches, and things like that to make them a little bit more creative as well as difficult for users who have been in the game for a very long time. Uh, cache types have evolved over the years from um, traditional containers. Sometimes um, it could be a lockbox. It could be um, a plastic sort of like Tupperware container. Um, I have one of these where we created and we put a little plastic tube in it um, just to be creative. So they come in all safe shapes and sizes. Um, the smallest is considered uh, what they call a nano, which is about the size, it could be the size of a pencil eraser or smaller. Um, then there's the nano, which is just a little bit bigger. Then there's a small, of course there's the uh, regular size, then there's a large, and then there's a super large, and then there's a mystery one. Again, geocaching.com can um, explain that, but I have a variety of sizes here. Th this one and this one here would be considered regular sizes. This would probably be a small, um, even this one might can be considered either maybe a small, maybe um, I, I probably more of a small because nanas are a little bit smaller than that. But um, it's just what you're looking for and the creativity of the, the the cash owners who put them out there, what you're looking for with that. Let's see here. Uh, let me go to my next page, okay? All right. Caches also come in the wide shapes and sizes that you see there, but they're also listed in there. Um, for, um, let's see here, <sighs> where they can be hit inside of. Uh, we have placed several caches out that look like birdhouses. Um, they're placed in either a tree or near sort of maybe like a welcome center, or uh, we've got a few near libraries that um, there's a birdhouse and then there's a small container like this hid within it. So it may not just be a straightforward container you're looking for. You might actually be looking for something that may actually have this inside of it. Um, a fun thing to consider um, when we have in one of our libraries, it's a uh, little free library and you have to find um, the first cache to be able to find the one that's in the library because it'll give you the combination of the lock to uh, open up the cache area so that you can sign the logbook for that. Um, let's see here. Uh, 
Mm. There's also replicas of, have you guys ever seen the little stones that they put out to hide, um, like your hide keys and things like that. And my little friend over here, she's had, she's having one of these. these are, this is a, a magnetic one where sometimes these are found on guardrails, um, po lighting poles, um, lamp skirts that are in parking lots and things like that. So this has been painted to match that. So it kind of blends in, makes it a little bit harder to find as well for that. Okay, what to bring with you. For starters, you need to have, make sure your phone is fully charged um, and that has the apps downloaded onto that you need or that at least your GPS has the loaded geocaches that you're going to go look for. Uh, to prep for the hike, you might want to make sure that uh, where the parking area is for your geocache location, carry with you a few essential items, um, swag, which is stuff we all get. Um, in this box right here, all of the little trinkets that are in this box is considered swag because it's tradable. Um, not everything in here will be tradable, but a majority of it. This would be the log book. That's what you sign, put it back. Here's the pen that you use to sign it and not all caches, so make sure you carry a pen or a pencil with you. Um, oh, look, here's some patches that you can trade for something. Um, let's see here. Oh, darn, not real money. There's some fake money in here. Um, but with swag, usually what you do is you bring something with you and you trade of equal or higher value for something that's in here for it. Um, I'm going to pull this one thing out because I'll explain a little bit more. This is what they call a trackable, and I'll explain um, shortly a little bit more about what uh, trackables and what trackable coins and stuff are with that. Um, one of the major things that you want to do if you do decide to do geocaching is the one requirement they have is you, it's not that you have to log it online or anything, but you have to make sure that you sign the logbook after you find it. That's the only requirements that geocaching.com requires for you if you're going geocaching with that. Um, another thing, again, again, I want to mention the pen or pencil. Um, we have a lot of people who find our caches but say, oh, forgot, couldn't sign the logbook because I didn't bring our pen or pencil. Well, technically, you didn't really find it because that's the only requirement is for you to sign the logbook. So try to always have a pen or a pencil stuck in your pocket so that you can make sure you sign the log once you found the cache. Because again, that's the only requirement for, for that, um, for anything. Um, sometimes if we're going to go walking for a long amount of time or through a park, sometimes even a trail, because we do a lot of trails here in Florida, we, um, we have hiking sticks or walking sticks that we take with us. It just helps us walk along the ground, keep our footing and things like that, and keeps me from getting um, any injuries, as well as sometimes we're poking in places that I'm not quite so sure that you want to stick your hand or your foot in. But having that stick there, it's really nice to be able to poke into areas that um, may not be safe or you may be not so sure about what you're going to um, find once you get in there. It might be just a plastic box, but it might be nice a nice little friendly critter or something like that. Spiders not all, are, 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 are sometimes nice, sometimes not so nice, and I don't like, I don't like spiders at all. Um, not to find them anyway. They're great for the environment. Uh, let's see here. Oh, time for the next page. <laughs> All right. So once um, you have figured out what caches and stuff that you want to find um, and you're close, it's time to start your sleuthing um, to find the hiding places for the caches. Um, take your time. Be observant. Notice if there's anything that's uh, sort of out of place. Um, we kind of call that using your geosense. Um, after several years, we started learning. It's like, oh, this is the the grass is trampled over this way a little bit more. Maybe we should go that way. Um, or um, the sticks, how come they're piled up in such a weird way? They would never fall naturally like that. Oh, here's a pile of stones that are stacked nice and neatly. They shouldn't be there. So you'll start developing that the more geocaching that you do. And uh, that was one of the fun things that I find interesting that I've developed with that. Um, once you find the caches, it's time for you to examine your caches treasure, which we covered with all of that fun stuff that's inside, which is their swag. Um, you wanna make sure once you take everything out, you put it back in, put it back in its place, make sure you sign the log, put all of that back in there, seal it up, and put it back exactly where you found it. Don't try to hide it someplace harder. Don't make it easier for someone else. Um, the cache owner who placed this cache out there um, has a specific reason for where it's placed. And they, it's not for you to decide, oh, let's make it a little bit harder or make it a little bit easier um, because that's where that terrain and, and the difficulty comes in for that. Um, 
Don't try to make it easier, harder for the person if I covered that already. Finally, be a good geocacher and CETO, which is cash in, trash out. Uh, as geocachers and people who sort of um, appreciate the environment and putting caches out in the environment, we want to make sure that we don't put one in an area that um, may harm, uh, especially down here, the tortoises. We don't put anything near where the tortoises might be. We wouldn't hide one where maybe there's a bald eagle nest. It's just for CETO as well, it's if we find litter around, we try to make sure we pick it up and take it and throw it away where it belongs and not leave it out in the environment. So that's one thing about CETO is we try to cash in, trash out, and keep the environment um, better than what we found it for that. So leave no trace is one of our mottos and it's basically our part of cleaning up our environment. Uh, another thing is you, once you log with the book, if you decide that you want to log it, you can log it in your app or when you get home and you can log it on your computer at geocaching.com. Um, you can actually write um, a very simple log on there, not only that includes your geocaching name, but did you find it? How did you find it? Was it really wet? Was it um, in perfect condition? Oh, um, the log was full. It, if you didn't have a replacement, you can say, hey, log was full. Or if you have a replacement log, you can just put a little tidbit in there saying, hey, I replaced the log with that um, because the log was full with it. Um, and just just make the geocacher who owns that, that cache feel a little really good. But also, I mean, you can give subtle hints about things, but you just can't lay it all out there. Just say, hey, it's up in the tree on the left limb with that. You might just say, ooh, it's really camouflaged in, the, in, in, in its location. Make sure you look uh, really hard for the camouflage with that. Um, let's see here. Um, biggest thing, just don't spoil it for, for the next user. It's okay to give them a hint, but just don't tell them exactly where it's at. Next, ooh, now guess what? We are talking about the trackables now. Um, trackables are special game pieces in our game. Um, it can be little trinkets like this that can be found in caches. I have a trackable on my car where people can discover it. Uh, they actually can't pick it up and take it with them, but they can discover it. Um, there's people who have tattoos with tra trackable numbers on them where you can discover them somewhere out and about and then just say, hey, guess what? I saw your tattoo. How cool is that? Um, but trackables, if you find them in a cache, these are game pieces that are meant to go from one cache location to another. They're not um, swag. They're not stuff that you get to keep and take home and enjoy. Um, these are actually sort of like, I would say, um, a owner's way of traveling the world through um, these pieces uh, for them because as they go from one cache to another, you actually log these as well and you can put a little note on it. It's like, hey, I found this at um, uh, near a Disney property and it was interesting to see that it enjoyed uh, hanging out with Goofy or we have one that's in Ireland. Hey, I love uh, being in Ireland for St. Patrick's Day. We'll uh, move this friendly tag on its way and hopefully get back home to you soon. So um, it's just a sort of like just a fun way for people to meet different people as well as hear about different people's travels along with uh, these these wonderful little trackables with that. Um, they can be just these little coins. They can be dog tags. They can be um, really big metal coins to little tiny ones. But th they come in all shapes and sizes and can be pretty much almost anything anymore um, with that. Or they can be attached to something. I know one time we had a wagon wheel that had a little path tag on it and it was traveling around and we cannot wait to get rid of that because that thing is huge and you definitely don't want to drag it from one cache to another and it won't fit in a regular cache so most of the time it's going to a geocaching event or some such. Um, these all have unique tracking numbers so this tracking number won't be the same thing that's on my car and vice versa. Uh, so if you find one of these, if you pick it up and take it with you, make sure you log it and move it on as soon as possible. Usually no more than two weeks, um, sooner the better. Or if you know that you're going somewhere soon enough, you can take it with you and drop it off in another cache and, and drop it in there for that. Um, again, geocaching.com will give you plenty of more information about that and um, great fun with it. So geocaching is celebrating 20 years this year um, of caching, which has evolved it's from a very vast, diverse, and passionate community of users. Um, you can do it on your own. 
You can do it with a few friends. You can do it as a large almost mob because um, there's actually mob caches too. Um, huge events, activities and programs, stuff like that. So um, geocaching is devoted to, um, all year round or you can just do it whenever you feel like it. Not only is it here, but it's global. There's a lot of people across um, the world who enjoy caching. Um, there's a film festival every year that people create films about how much they enjoy geocaching. And um, it's they're shared around. There's a big events about it. So it's not one of those things that it's just localized in the United States. It's everywhere. So if you ever take a trip, take your, take your smartphone, pick, take your app with you, and find some amazing caches in some other countries as well. Um, however you choose to do it, um, geocaching is fun, um, a great exercise, and it can be addictive. Um, it's just, it's just a fun thing to do as well as you're using, uh, skills that, um, you develop over time with it. Um, my name is Miss Crystal, but my geocaching name is Four Hammericks. Uh, I hope you have fun. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I work at the library. More than happy to help you along, answer any questions you might have. And my advice to you, have fun and cash on. Isn't that a cool hobby? And you can do it as long as you have a smartphone and remember to bring your pen. And now we are going to go over to Miss Susan and learn about Osceola history. Because as Bex and Charlie hunt the monsters around town, they have to go to some local historical sites. And did you know that here in Osceola, we have historical sites all around us? All right, let's go find out. Hi, everybody. I'm Miss Susan, Buenaventura Lakes Branch of Osceola Library System. And I'm here today with Miss Michelle and Mr. Holmes and Miss Mia somewhere there from the Osceola Historical Society. And we're going to interview them and have some questions with them. So do you want to introduce yourself? I am the curator here at Osceola History. And I'm John Holmes. I'm a retired history teacher from Osceola County. And I volunteer out at the Pioneer Village, uh, talking mostly about this area in the late 1800s, what it was like when the first settlers came in here and when Kissimmee and St. Cloud were first established. My first question then is, what are some of our local historical sites? Well, in Kissimmee, the first one that jumps out at you is the courthouse. Mm -hmm. We have the oldest courthouse in Florida that is still in its original condition and in use on a, day, on a daily basis. Um, no other county has that. The courthouse was dedicated in 1890. Wow. So that makes it, what, 130 years old? Over in St. Cloud, uh, a historic building would be the old GAR Hall on Massachusetts. Um, the GAR was a veterans organization of Union Civil War veterans, um, sort of like the VFW or um, American Legion today, but this was for Union Civil War soldiers. And St. Cloud began as a retirement community for Union Civil War veterans about 1909. Before that, St. Cloud had a train station and some tents. Um, after that, they had hundreds of houses. Are there any buildings around that, besides the courthouse, that are not very much changed from when they were first built? There are some. For example, the Methodist Church on Church Street, um, built in 1913. Mm -hmm. And it has, and from the outside, it hasn't changed much since then. Uh, the Presbyterian Church on Church Street has been there almost as long, and uh, it's still there in its original configuration. Do you have any insights on what Osceola County was like 100 years ago? Let's take it a little further. Um, Kissimmee mm -hmm. was originally established as Kissimmee City Station in 1883. At that time, uh, you know the median that runs down the middle of the street in Kissimmee? Mm -hmm. that's, where the railroad that's where the railroad tracks were. And downtown Kissimmee gets its shape because it grew up on each side of the railroad tracks. 
Now later, the tracks were moved over to where they are now. But in the beginning, it went, they went right through the middle of town. Now in 1883, Kissimmee had a livery stable. That was a place where you took care of horses. Mm -hmm. They had uh, a bakery. They had a hotel under construction. Um, that was in the location where the, I guess it used to be a bank. Now it's the Morgan and Morgan building there in downtown. That's where the hotel was under construction. And there were 16 houses, all the color of new pine. That was Kissimmee. Now they did have one modern amenity. There was a saloon in town where a cattleman could ride up to the side of the building and buy a drink out through the window without having to get off his horse. You might call it the first drive through. Okay, Michelle, I think this one's for you. When a visitor comes to the museum, what can we expect to see there? So in our museum, we talk about and we display everything that is Osceola County. You start from the swamplands and like the history of nature in Osceola County, and we move on to some seminal history and early settlers. And we go on into the basic industries of Osceola County. Everything's going on in here. <laughs> That's okay. Um, but our basic industries of Osceola County were citrus. You had um, turpentine, uh, logging. There were um, cattle. The cattle industry was huge. And we hit all of those things. And then we move on into our early pioneers and pioneer life and how that looked in the early 1900s. And we move on into where we are now in the lakefront, which um, we're getting into this more modern history. And that leads into our last little bit of our exhibit, which is the tourism industry and what Main Street looked like, what tourism uh, looked like in Osceola County. What about out at Pioneer Village? At Pioneer what Village, we see out there. Okay. At Pioneer Village, we showcase our historic buildings of Osceola County. You can see buildings such as the Cadman House and the Bunk House. There, we have a replica church, a schoolhouse, a general store. You go in there and you see what Osceola County may have looked like. What do you think would be a surprise for residents of Osceola County to find out about our history that maybe they didn't know that would be a surprise? You normally think of cowboys and posses and gunfighters and um, outlaws and cattle rustlers. You normally think of Texas or Oklahoma or Arizona. You don't think of Central Florida. But in the 1870s, 80s, 90s, this was part of the Wild West with all of those things. Is there anything you guys would want to add to this before we finish? Come visit us at Osceola History. <laughs> um, we'd love to see you here. Mr. Holmes, anything from you? Well, out at the Pioneer Village, uh, if we have groups coming around, I portray one of those cow hunters. And social distancing isn't a problem because my whip is six feet long. And <laughs> if you're close enough to get popped, you're too close. Thank you for taking time out of your day to answer a few questions for us. And hopefully we can maybe do this again in person sometime soon. All of this monster hunting and learning about our history has me hungry. So let's go to Miss Michelle's kitchen and she can whip us up some monsterly good pancakes. Ah. Hi, welcome to my segment on monster pancakes. Today I'm gonna make some yummy monster pancakes. And these are the things that you're gonna need if you wanna follow along at home. You can get pancake mix, it doesn't matter what kind. You can get this at the store. Um, you can get the generic or you can get Bisquick or you can get, there's gluten-free, there's Kato, whatever your family dietary needs are. Pick up the pancake mix and then you're gonna look on the back and it tells you how or what you'll need in order to mix up a pancake mix. 
For this one, it's one cup of pancake mix, which is our dry measuring cup, to two thirds cup water. Now I personally like milk. It makes the pancakes taste a little richer. So I used milk and that is our wet measuring cup. I measured two thirds cup there. And we mixed it all up. And this is our main color of our pancake. Okay, so this is your base color. So you mix it all up. And once you get it mixed up, I used a little hand blender because it kind of got the lumps out. And when you uh, are putting them in bottles to make monster pancakes, uh, getting the lumps out is, is pretty important. So I used my hand mixer. Once you get it to the consistency you want, then you're gonna pour a little bit of this batter into little bowls, okay? I just have little tiny mixing bowls. And for this one, I used green and I used a lot, well, I can't say a lot, but I did make it bright because I like bright colors. So we have green today. Then I used another measuring cup, put some of the regular in here, added blue food coloring. Isn't that a pretty blue? Yeah. Just use the regular blue food coloring. And my third one that I made, I put the batter in here, mixed it up, and I have orange. I like that orange. I made it nice and bright. So those are the three colors I'm gonna, or I'm gonna actually work with four colors. I did make one other one earlier, pink. Who can't have pink in your pancakes, right? So we have pink. Now I'm using these bottles. We got these bottles off Amazon, but you can get the ketchup mustard bottles at Walmart or Dollar Tree, anywhere you want to get there, just the ketchup mustard bottles. And I put pink in it. I poured my orange in one. I poured my blue in one. I poured my green in one. And then I have the base. This is the regular color. This is what came out of here. This is what's going to go in the back of your pancake. Now I did try smaller little ones. These are do help with detail if you want to get really detailed on your monster, but it's really hard to get the pancakes or our pancake mix into the into the jar. Um, I did try also to use baggies where I took baggies and I put the pancake mix into the baggie and clipped the corner. You can do that, but you have to make the clip really, really small or it comes out really, really fast. So if you really want to make really cool looking ones with some more detail, go ahead and invest in a few of these bottles and you can make them with these instead. Okay, and then of course, for when we get finished, we're gonna need butter and some kind of syrup. And again, they have flavored syrup, they have sugar-free syrup, totally up to you. And of course, I have these little edible eyeballs. So we're gonna use those to make the eyes. All right, guys. So this is the things you need. This is how you're gonna set it up. And if you join me back in just a second, we'll take you to the griddle. Okay, our griddle's been heating up while I made the pancake mix. I've had the heat on a medium and I want the whole griddle to be over the, over the, the top of the stove. It needs to be an even heat. Okay, and then I'm gonna take Pam or something similar. Um, I'm gonna spray it on. This is extra virgin olive oil. Spray it all over our pan. This is what will keep it from sticking. If you don't have that and wanna put a little bit of oil on a paper towel and rub it all over, you can, that works. But this just works better and it's a little easier. Kinda of like that better. Okay, now I have the heat. I don't want it too hot. I don't want it too cool. If it's too hot, it will cook too fast. But if it's too cool, then it will cook too slow. So we're gonna have it a medium heat, make sure the whole griddle is evenly heated. Okay, now I wanna take the pink and I'm going to make an outline of our monster. Now this monster is pretty big. This is, is really big. Uh, make a smiley face here. Uh, when you go to make them, you'll probably wanna make it about fourth the size. Doesn't have to be as big. Now I'm going to take the blue, I'm going to give it hair. I'm 
And whatever design I put on the pan right now will be the design that I have when I go to flip it over. Give it just random little hair, little designs. Okay, good. All right, so now I'm gonna take the green and I'm gonna give our little monster legs and arms, give him some feet. And I have to make sure that the pancake mix, the green touches the pink. So when I go to flip it over, they'll stick together. Give it a couple fingers. Again, it's a monster, it doesn't have to be perfect. All right. Um, I think I'm gonna put some little dots on. Let's put some dots on. Okay, that'll work. Now I'm gonna take some orange, nice contrasting color, and I'm gonna add some random little wigglies. Okay, there we go. And again, whatever I put on the griddle here, when I go to flip it, it will be the face of the actual monster. Okay, now this is just the regular uh, pancake mix that I'm gonna put all over the back. I'm gonna keep it within the pink lines. Okay, see how the pink lines are cooked up? They're already cooked, so the pancake mix should stay within the pancake itself. Kind of like coloring in a coloring book, you wanna stay in the black lines. Well, this you wanna stay in your the lines of your monster, the outside lines. Just gonna squeeze out as much that will come out. Okay, might be running out a little bit here. It's okay, I've got plenty of pancake mix. Yep, almost out in this bottle. Okay, I think I'll take the lid off. A little bit more. All right, gonna take the lid off. I'm gonna pour out the rest. Okay. okay, not much left of that. It's okay, I'm gonna to go to the bowl. I'm gonna scrape out some in the bowl. Again, we wanna fill in that whole back part. There we go. A few more holes. We'll go ahead and add pink. I've got plenty of pink. All right, fill in all those little holes there. Now what you're looking at is the back of the pancake. Parts of the pancake have already cooked. Um, if you look at the arm, you notice they have bubbles on them. That means they're ready to turn, but the rest of the pancake isn't. Um, I have a spot there that I'm gonna need some more green, so it will attach to the monster itself. All right, good. Now, as you can see, the inside of the pancake here is still wet. You want it to be bubbling like the arms kind of are bubbly because if you do it too fast, it's too liquidy. It won't flip right. This is too wet right now. We want it to be cooked like the outside. So we're gonna give it just a minute to cook on the inside as well. Okay, give it a minute. All right, you can see the bubbles on the top now. That means it's ready to flip. I'm gonna loosen up the legs, okay, and the arms. Okay, and the little small spots on the edges, so they'll flip as well. Um, may need two if it's this big, but I always suggest a parent with this. Okay, gonna put it all the way under. All right, and one, two, three! Woo, we did it! Looky there, it's nice and done. All right, and the smiley face. Now I'm gonna add some edible eyes. One and two. Okay, you gotta push him in there a little bit. All right, gonna get his leg out here. Nope, gotta stay. That's okay. All right, so here is our monster, you guys. And I hope you enjoyed this segment. Please make sure that a parent is with you when you do yours. It was fun. Thank you. Bye.
All right, now we are going to play a game where I read the description of each of the monsters from the book, and you guys get to guess which monster I'm talking about, okay? Okay. All right, here we go. So our first monster is, um, it was covered in fur like a wolf, but also had two long, sharp fangs poking out of its mouth and glowing red eyes. Lisa, I saw your hand. I see Vamp Wolf. Correct. The Vamp Wolf. Very nice. Nice. Okay. I'll go to this one in the back. I'll switch it up a little. Um, eight black furry legs staring at us with glowing red eyes and fangs that dripped with goo. It was huge. Ooh. Taller than a person and twice as wide. Okay, Michelle? Spider Fang? Spider Fang. Oh, the monster at the end of the book. Yeah, right? Just, that's all right. Sounds terrible. Right? <laughs> okay, here we go. This one has a short description. Uh, giant, oversized vultures with the faces of dragons. Mm. I know, this one's hard. Okay, Susan? What is Firewing? The Firewing. You're right, you're right. Hi. Okay, I'll That's go back to the front of the book. Let's see here. Uh, oh, okay. Half penguin... Half unicorn, all angry monster. It was almost cute with its short legs and round tummy, but then it opened its mouth and I remembered that they had fangs. Okay, uh, I think I saw Lisa. I can't, you, Uniguin. Uniguin, the Uniguin, right? Unicorn. Yeah. Okay. No, if I want to participate, because I don't know if I'll be able to say the names. This one's my favorite. <laughs> This one's my favorite. Uh, this uh, was this monster was in the art room. An amorphous blob, the color of poop and the smell not too far from it. Ew. Crystal, the teddy, the teddy glob. That one's my favorite. Oh, I, did. I like that one. You see it just crawling around. <laughs> I love that. Okay, and uh, here we go. A giant puppy dog face with floppy ears, which didn't sound scary, but the rest of its body was that of a lion, and it opened its mouth and roared its fangs. Oh, I have a little... Okay, Crystal? The fur claw? The fur claw, yeah. Okay. I always yeah. thought that one sounded really, really cute. It does. It doesn't sound oh. bad at all. No, he doesn't sound bad to me either. Okay, we have two more. Oh, boy. A pig with a cat's face. It had long eyelashes and a little pink nose. In the game, this was a feared beast, but in real life, it looked strangely sweet. I will go with Susan. <laughs> I think it was a tie with me and Lisa. Um, the, um, the Omnicat or whatever that... Oinkat. Oh. Oinkat. Oinkat. You got it. <laughs> Meow. All right. Last one. It had the face of a shark. But also, slimy legs and a reptilian tail. Okay, Michelle? Shark face? Shark face. That was fun. Is there pictures of these creatures? I know. I would love to see some people draw I pictures of them. these creatures. Yeah, that would be cool. Right? Be cool. So, now we're going to talk about some real-life monsters. Wasn't that fun? And now we're going to talk about some real life monsters from nature. These are animals that you could still find today. And the first one is the giant squid. And the giant squid grows up to 40 feet long and can weigh as much as 2,000 pounds. And the eye of the giant squid can be as much as 10 inches in diameter. This large eye allows the giant squid to see up to 400 feet so that it can see if there's a sperm whale anywhere in the ocean. The sperm whale is the natural predator of the giant squid. But you're not likely to meet the giant squid because these are found about 900 feet below sea level. And our next real life monster is the golden crown flying fox. And this is actually a fruit eating mega bat found in the Philippines. It's one of the largest bat species in the world and its wingspan is up to five to six feet across, which is almost this big. It's as tall as your dad probably. 
It eats fruits, primarily figs, and when it poops these fig seeds out, that helps with the reforestation of the Philippines, which is good because this flying megabat is actually going extinct because its natural habitats are being taken up as humans uh, deforest the planet. So we have to take care of our real life monsters. And our next real life monster is the African cave spider. And this spider can grow up to five to six inches across. That's almost as big as my hand, almost as big as a dinner plate. It only has six legs, and that's because its front legs have evolved to become two feelers that it uses to poke around under logs or move rocks aside to find the tiny insects that it eats. But even though this looks like a fearsome creature, it actually doesn't sting and it doesn't bite humans. So it's harmless to us. Our last real life monster is the water bug. And this is the largest bug in the world. It can grow up to five inches long and hunt prey much larger than itself, such as bugs, fish, small reptiles, and amphibians. And it uses its hu uh, powerful forelimbs to grab its play or prey and get it hooked. And then it takes its rostrum, which is a needle-like part of its mouth, and it inserts it into its prey where it injects its saliva, which actually melts the inside of the prey, all the bones and the organs, and then guess what it does? Using the rostrum like a straw, it drinks the inside. <sighs> Ew! It's almost like a vampire, isn't it? So those are some of the natural, real-life monsters we can find in the world today. And now, we're going over to Miss Lisa, because remember the teddy globs from our book? Those creatures that have, like, a gummy body and then, like, a bear's head? Well, Miss Lisa is going to do a science experiment with gummy bears! Hi, everyone! Are you ready for some candy chemistry? Well, today... We're going to be doing a fun gummy bear experiment. But before we begin, we have to make sure you have the supplies that you need. You're going to need some gummy bears, of course. You're going to need five containers that you can put liquid in. I chose clear plastic cups so that I can see through them and see what's inside them. You're going to need something to write with and some paper so that you can label those cups. You're also going to need a ruler that has a centimeter side because gummy bears are so small that it will be more accurate if we use the centimeter side to measure the gummy bears. And you are also going to need a gummy bear experiment recording sheet. Now, on this sheet, you'll see it says liquid number one. We are going to write our first liquid on that line. You'll also see it says length and width, both in centimeters, and observations. That's where we put some of the things that we notice as we're going through our experiment. You'll also see two rows. One says before, one says after, and that's what we're going to put our data about our gummy bears before we put them in the water and after they come out of the water or whatever liquid we use. So basically, basically, our experiment is going to be what happens to gummy bears if we put them in different liquids? What do you think is going to happen? So I've got five different liquids and I take my cup and I put in the first one water. Now, all that's in that cup is water, nothing else. And remember, you want to record your data. So here, um, where it says liquid number one, I put water. I also put a half a cup in parentheses because that's how much water that's in the glass. Now for the second one, you'll see it says sugar. What I did was take that same half a cup of water and I put it in the glass and then I added one tablespoon of sugar and I mixed it up really good so it would dissolve. The next one, I took that same half a cup of water, put it in the glass, and this time it says salt. I added a tablespoon of salt. Again, I mixed it really, really well till that salt dissolved. The next one you'll see says vinegar. Now, I didn't put any water in this cup. I just put a half a cup of vinegar. And the last one says soda. I didn't put any water in this cup either, I put a half a cup of soda and I used ginger ale. Now that I filled my cups, as I was going along, I should have been writing on each line what my liquids were. And then I am going to measure my gummy bears because a good scientist is going to take information as they go along about what they're doing. So 
since I said my gummy bear was small, I'm going to use a centimeter side. And it says length in centimeters. So basically the length is from the top of the gummy bear to the bottom of the gummy bear, about how tall he is. So I'm going to start on the zero and put him next to my ruler. And you'll see he's about two centimeters long. All right. Then I'll write that down. Then I want to know how wide he is. So I'm going to take my gummy bear and write this from side to side, basically. So I'm going to put him on that zero again, and I'm going to measure him going across. And he's about one centimeter wide. I'm going to write that down too. Now I could take him and I could put him in my first liquid, which is water. So I'm going to drop him in the water. Now I'm going to go on with my second liquid. The second one is sugar water. So where it says liquid number two, I wrote down sugar water. I also wrote down in parentheses a half a cup of water and one tablespoon of sugar because that's what I used in there. All right. I'm going to take my gummy bear and I'm going to measure him again. Now, I will tell you, the gummy bears are probably almost all the same size because it's made by a machine and machines are really good at making things the same over and over again. But a good scientist will still measure to make sure that that is accurate. So I put my gummy bear on my ruler. He's about two centimeters long. I'm gonna put him up and measure his width. He's about one centimeter wide. I wrote that down here. I'm going to take my gummy bear. I'm gonna put him in the sugar water. All right, now I'm going to do the same for the rest of the cups. I am going to measure my gummy bear, the length and the width. I already measured these. They're all two centimeters by one centimeter. And I put him into the salt. Then I measure my gummy bear, two centimeters by one centimeter. Put him in the vinegar. I'm stuck to my finger. Ah, there we go. And then I'm going to measure the last one for the soda. Again, he's two centimeters by one centimeter, approximately. So I'm going to put him in the soda. And again, he's stuck to my finger. Go down, Mr. Gummy Bear. There we go. He's, <laughs> he really doesn't want to come off my finger, does he? There we go. All along, as I was measuring my gummy bears, I was recording the information on the data sheet. Now, you'll see the column that says observation. You are going to see what happens to each one of these gummy bears in each one of these liquids, but as you can see, nothing happened right away. So what you're going to do is you are going to observe these gummy bears, come back in maybe about an hour, see what happens. If there's any changes, write it down under observation. Then come back and come back about, say, three hours. Again, see if there's any difference. Does anything happen? Do they get bigger? Do they get smaller? Do they change color? I don't know. You're gonna to have to do the experiment to find out. And if you notice anything different, you're gonna write it down under the, col the column that says observations. Then again, you're gonna come back in like 24 hours and see what happens. Now, you don't wanna take out the gummy bears before 24 hours, but after 24 hours, observe them, see what happens, all right? Now, so basically what's happening in this experiment is something called osmosis. Now, osmosis is just the movement of water molecules from what they call a less concentrated solution to a more concentrated solution through what they call a partially permeable membrane. It means that the liquid can go across it. So basically, that means that since the gummy bear contains very little water, when we put the gummy bear into the cup of water, the, gum, the water moves from the cup into the gummy bear by the process that we just said was called osmosis. Now, the gummy bears are made mostly of sugar and a solid jello-like substance that we call gelatin. That gelatin acts like that cell membrane. And when the gummy bear is now placed into the sugar water, the water moves into the gelatin because there are more sugar molecules in the gummy bear than in the water. So can you guess what happens? I think you're right. The gummy bear grows bigger. But when the gummy bear is put into the salt water, the water moves out of the gelatin because there are more salt molecules in the salt than in the gummy bear. So what do you think is gonna to happen to that gummy bear? I think you got it. I think that gummy bear might shrink. So, like I said, you don't wanna take these gummy bears out for at least 24 hours. Once you take them out, 
you are going to record on your record sheet what you notice. You're going to record, and this one is going to be the, the row. This is after. What color are they? Are they still red? Did they change color? I don't know. How long are they? Measure them again from the tallest part, from the top, the longest part of both sides. And then that will be how long they are. Then you're going to measure their width across. See what happens. Was it the same? Did it change? I don't know. And you're going to do this for all of these liquids that you used. But like I said, it's not happening right now. So I'm going to fast forward 24 hours and see what happens. Follow me. I'll be right back. So you'll notice I took my gummy bears out of the water and I put them on paper towels labeled. And the gummy bear that was just in water looks almost like a blob. It got bigger, but not by too much. The one that was in sugar looked like it got a lot bigger. The one in salt looks a little bit bigger, but it was supposed to get smaller. I wonder why that happened. You'll see the one in vinegar. There's not one there because the acid in the vinegar totally dissolved my gummy bear. And you'll see the one in soda got bigger also. You'll notice I went back to my gummy bear experiment recording sheet and in the after row, I wrote the new length and the width of what it was like after it came out of the liquid. So you'll see the gummy bear that was in the water was about three centimeters from its longest point to its longest point and two centimeters wide. All right, the one in the sugar was about three and a half centimeters in length by two centimeters wide. The one in salt was two centimeters by one centimeter. It stayed about the same. And again, I wonder why that is. I wonder if I had put more salt in the water, maybe that would have changed it because like I said, it was supposed to get smaller. And the one in vinegar, there is no data because it totally dissolved it. Okay, so you'll notice on the back of the gummy bear experiment sheet that there are some blank spaces. That's for you to take different liquids and try your gummy bears in different liquids than you already used. Now make sure those liquids are okay with your grown-ups to use. But maybe you try something like pure lemon juice or just food coloring or, I don't know, use your imagination. And once you have your gummy bears in the liquids, record that data. Or you might want to take these gummy bears and try to put them back in their original containers. Maybe if I put this gummy bear in the salt water and I left it for another day, maybe that would make it shrink. Try different things to expand, extend your experiment. Maybe instead of using a half a cup of water in each cup, what would happen if I used a cup of water? Would it change the outcome? What happens is instead of using one tablespoon of sugar, I put two tablespoons of sugar in there. What happens in the salt one if I put two tablespoons of salt before I put the gummy bear in there? Maybe that would make it shrink. I don't know. Find out what will happen. Write your data down on your gummy bear experiment sheet and share that with us. We would love to see what your results are from your experiment. I hope you had as much fun today with the gummy bear experiment as I did, and thanks for joining me. Thanks for joining us for the first episode of the Sunshine Readers Book Club. I'm Mr. Jonathan at the Osceola Library, and make sure that if you want to read Gamer Squad, Attack of the Not-So-Virtual Monsters by Kim Harrington, that you come check this book out at the library. Or you can visit Cloud Library if you have an Osceola Library card, and you can read it digitally as an ebook. Make sure to come back in two weeks because we're going to read Beatrice Sinker, Upside Down Thinker by Shelley Johannes. See you next time. Bye-bye.